Hi, everyone. We're continuing with our Isaiah series. We're in the fourth and final week of our discussion of the character of Isaiah. And we've been somewhat walking through the book of Isaiah as well, not from a chronological or narrative standpoint, but simply in an effort to understand the language of this prophet so that the message he gave to the people of Israel then can carry some of the weight and beauty to us today as well, as we encounter God in a different context than the people that were listening to the prophet Isaiah. We experience his gifts and his grace in ways that are unique to our time and to, and to us. But what's beautiful about this particular prophecy and this particular prophet is the ways in which he describes God's actions. The ways in which he describes God's heart and God's generosity still apply to you and me. We spent a little bit of time in the first week talking about the language of Isaiah, the world of Isaiah. How do we understand a book that seems to so quickly switch back and forth between good times and bad times, judgment and comfort, redemption and disobedience? But we did so recognizing that life for us is a lot like that too. We may be experiencing a great day at work and a terrible day at home, and it's all contained in the same 24 hours. But God's word speaks through all of that in a comprehensive and applicable way. Then we spent a little bit of time listening to some of the law, the accusations, the disobedience of God's people. We heard about how the great mistake they were making at the time of Isaiah was the false idols they were worshiping, how they would bow down and worship things they exerted power over themselves to bring into existence, how they would burn uh, wood from a tree they chopped down to, to roast some food over a fire and then carve a little bit of that same tree into an idol and thank it for the meal. It just uh, is, is, is unreasonable to people like us as we try and turn our heads to understand the perspective of the people at that time. So after understanding the language and world of Isaiah and the disobedience, the law that he brought to them, we also looked at the centrality of the idea of Zion, the holy city, Jerusalem, as the place in history, on the world, where we, through God's actions in that place, are welcomed into the kingdom of God. And the boundaries of God's kingdom are not limited to a city or a particular region, but instead through the actions taken by God in that place, there is a global invitation into participation and citizenship in God's family and God's kingdom. Today, we're going to hear specifically about how Jesus is the fulfillment of the grace that God gives, the grace that God won for us on the cross through the Messiah. We're going to hear one of the most familiar and famous prophecies of the Savior that comes from Isaiah to the people of his day. And of course, the people hearing it at that time, they were blind to what the fulfillment would look like. They were, were anticipating a Messiah, but their own presuppositions or expectations may or may not have matched up to what the true reality of Jesus Christ coming into the world was. But as we look back and listen to God's word, not only through the words that Jesus tells us, but then understand how it's true through looking at it in the lens of Isaiah, we begin to see this picture of God's heart and God's own compassion for his people, even all the way back then, at the height of their disobedience, at the height of their distance from God, he gives them this promise of salvation. And that's really the theme that I hope you catch on to from this entire series in Isaiah. The prophet who speaks God's word to the people at a time and in a way that is applicable specifically to them. It's contextual, in other words. And yet, even with that specific context, God's word speaks to every one of his followers throughout all time. And the promises he gave to, uh, he gave to his people then for a savior help us to recognize who Jesus is and how he lived at the time when he walked on this earth and how the actions he took and the things that happened to him fulfill the promises God has been giving to his people for thousands of years. So let's listen into Isaiah chapter 53. You've heard these verses before in all likelihood, but listen to how it's a description. In the midst of all of these things we've been studying, the ways in which God describes his people as rebellious, they've turned away from him even though he raised them. They're worshiping false gods that don't give them the gifts that he gives them, that don't walk with them the way that he has walked with them that are just false and made up and not true like he is. And we understand that God had promised for them this geographic fulfillment of his promises through the place of Zion and how in the future there would be this fulfillment of Zion in a heavenly way, in a way that brings all people together through Jesus. Today, hear these verses in that context, in light of all of those things, in the backdrop of God's promises, of his laws, of his, of his fulfillment, 
hear what the prophet Isaiah has to say about the Savior. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. As we hear those verses, as we read through those words and encounter the promise of the Savior that we know to be true, we can look back to a historical person, to Jesus Christ, and say that was who Isaiah was talking about. And we we receive this picture of what salvation looks like, of what the transformation that goes on within us as, as we trust in God's promises, as He has poured out His Spirit of forgiveness on us, as he has made us his children. We embrace and and lift high these words because of the beautiful picture they paint of who God is and how he is disposed toward his people. We can read through the whole book of Isaiah and we understand that there are grave mistakes made by God's people. There are great sins that are being committed. There is abandonment and forgetfulness and wandering off. There is rejection of God's people. And even in these verses, these familiar prophecies of who the Savior was. We hear the, the, the voices of those who put Jesus on the cross. We hear the ways in which the, the church leaders at the time uh, pushed Jesus away and, and began to conspire against him. We hear how even the people of that day and the people today look to a beaten and battered and crucified Jesus and think, what would ever make me want to trust in a God who has to go through something like that? Our doubts are voiced even here in this prophecy, in these words of Isaiah. And then there's that beautiful switch, that that change, that reversal of what is really happening here. How through the paradoxical effort of God, the evil that that we pointed towards Jesus, the evil expectations, the evil interpretations, the evil intent, the people brought against Jesus became the catalyst for change. And through those very acts, healing is administered. Forgiveness is won. Grace is given. Those who are broken are are able to be made whole. Those who have wandered off are able to be brought back. Those who have rebelled against the Lord are brought back into a place of membership, of adoption, of relationship with God. Jesus went to those who were lost. He went and died for those who had rejected him. God's mercy and grace, present, described, promised here in Isaiah for them, for for those people too, for the people of Israel that had wandered away from God, who were worshiping false idols in the forests or on the plains, who had rejected his prophets, who had turned away and and followed their own instincts. God's promises were for them too. And they heard this message from Isaiah, the same message you and I receive from God today. For our sins, he was punished. For our mistakes, he was put to death. For our guilt. And yet, through that suffering, through that punishment, through that death, God wins for us freedom, forgiveness, a new life, a new identity. No longer are we known solely by our problems and our mistakes and our sinfulness and our corruption. Instead, we can say, I am known by the name of Jesus. I am known by what he has done. I am changed because of his actions. I am forgiven because of what God has done. This is in line with his character. This is the way he's been speaking to his people all the way from the beginning. And as we spend time in these four weeks walking through Isaiah, 
we begin to understand how even here in these familiar verses, there is an unending, an undying, an, an inexhaustible amount of reverence and worship and beauty that we can find as we listen to these verses again and again and again. Know that those promises that the people of Israel heard are for you too. God loves you. He has won for you forgiveness. Sometimes Isaiah is called the fifth gospel because of this very chapter, this promise of grace, this expression of God's love. So I hope that as we have walked through these four weeks together, we understand that the language of God can match our experience of life, that God calls us out from our mistakes, from our wanderings, from our rejections, just as specifically and contextually as he did for the people of Isaiah's day. We also know that God has welcomed us into his kingdom through the actions that took place in Jerusalem and that there will be a heavenly kingdom in which we already are a part. And all of that because of the person who won for us forgiveness and citizenship in heaven, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you go into the week ahead, I encourage you to take a little bit of time now, a few moments, a few minutes maybe to, to pray. 
Just pray that God would open up your eyes to the ways in which he's fulfilling his promises. He is bringing about his grace and his peace to you in the week ahead and how you may be a part of how he delivers those same gifts to somebody else. We've heard the words of Isaiah together over these last four weeks. We understand that God speaks to us. Let's pray that he would open our hearts and open our ears to hear him. Let's take some quiet time now together to pray. Father does. 